Okay, I have a thumbs up to welcome everybody to our uh, <coughs> discussion today. And we don't have podiums or PowerPoints, as you can see, on uh, philanthropy and civil society in general and its importance to uh, social and economic growth, as well as um, having two wonderful, uh, extraordinary gentlemen here who uh, have been very involved in international development, the private sector, and economic growth, and the Aga Khan network of many, many institutions here today to uh, talk especially about the Aga Khan Foundation. And we, um, we have the Aga Khan, you will have, you have bios uh, at your chairs, more detailed bios of them. So I'm not going to go through everybody's accomplishments, but I will say that the two gentlemen on my left have um, Drs. Um, Laka and um, uh, Jahani uh, have both worked in the Aga Khan Foundation, with the Aga Khan University, with the Aga Khan Network, with the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development, and the entire work of civil society. And both have been involved in government with um, Dr. Laka being a cabinet minister for education in Pakistan, and uh, Dr. Jahani working with DFID. A little louder. I, I think that this is, yeah, maybe that's what I thought. Um, and I have a soft voice anyway. Good. <clears throat> OK. OK, so should I still rely on this, or? OK. Now, is that any better? Yes. Oh, OK, good. <clears throat> so um, our two extraordinary gentlemen have been very involved with the Aga Khan Network, and as well as government, as I just said, with the Cabinet Minister for Education and Dr. Jahani with uh, being the uh, working as an economist with DFID in the UK. And um, uh, Dr. Laka has been extraordinarily, has had a huge field in business and has been a an entrepreneur, so uh, we have, and then both of them now have, you know, dedicated their professional pursuits to civil society, and they're, they're leaders in this area as well. And um, I wanted to, when I worked in government foreign aid, <clears throat> and I lived in Africa, and then I, f for four years, headed up our aid to Asia and the Middle East for the Agency for International Development as a presidential appointee. I had I was look I was seeing the Aga Khan Foundation and meeting some of your representatives and getting to know your projects and visiting them and in some cases aid was helping out on them um, and so I um, really I'd always noticed and respected it and that was when I was beginning my career in aid and then as my learning curve on international development progressed and I started seeing what was working and what was not working, which you really do see after a while <laughs> when you're working <laughs> in a government aid agency. Um, I respected the Aga Khan Foundation more and more because all of the things that I was seeing that were working in development and that we write about now here in our Center for Global Prosperity were things being done by the Aga Khan Foundation. And that is recognizing the limits of government aid and working to break down um, the dependency on government foreign aid. The discussion so often around government aid is, well, how can we increase it? And, and nobody ever really talks about, well, how can we graduate countries? How can we lessen foreign aid so countries can take off? Very and, and, you know, we need to change that discussion. And the Aga Khan Foundation has been doing that for years. And also on the importance of homegrown solutions, what we call demand-driven growth and involvement, sustainability, social entrepreneurship, and of course, strengthening civil society. And so um, really, Aga Khan Foundation was there on the, you were on the front lines of this way before any of the Western donors were. And um, you, you know this, but I want to just make sure everybody in this room does who may be new to hearing about the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, so I think that it was probably my coming to this conclusion about development and seeing your work and saying, hey, it can work out there, which led me to my whole philosophy about foreign aid, was very inspired by you. Um, and we, and I, I, since I don't have a PowerPoint, you're very lucky, we don't have to <laughs> look at a lot of numbers, but 
what I have been working on here at the Hudson Institute for 15 years is um, measuring the amount. We started off by measuring the amount of foreign aid <clears throat> that went from developed countries, um, uh, the private philanthropy, private philanthropy and how much that was from developed countries going into the developing world. And that is our index of global philanthropy and remittances, which is online at our website at um, global-prosperity.org. You can download the last eight years of these um, for free. And we, this last um, year, we, um, via a, a grant from the Canadian International Development for International Development Research Center, added on uh, emerging economies. So we're very excited about that. We added on um, Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. And we went in and worked with local partners to see what they were doing, not only in their domestic philanthropy, but what they were giving um, to developing countries as well. And one thing about our index is, because it's our philosophy as well, that you really can't use just one financial flow as a measure of a country's generosity, just like you can't use government aid as a measure of a country's generosity. We measure not only uh, philanthropy, but the remittances going from countries into the developing world, as well as the private capital investment. And <clears throat> what we found in this, and I'm sure this is probably the case for philanthropy, and I know, Dr. Laka, you are, he's doing wonderful measurement of Pakistani's philanthropy that he will talk to you about. Um, that before 1990s, before the 1990s, the ratio of government aid to all private flows, by all private I'm talking about philanthropy, remittances, and capital investment, that ratio was 70 per, or 80 percent government and 20 percent private. But it went from the 1960s or so. But when it, you hit the 90s, that, uh, those lines um, crossed, and now today, it's 80% all private flows and 20% all government, which is a thing to rejoice about. Mm -hmm. It means that the developing world is business ready. I mean, it has receivers of private funds that are starting businesses, that are starting foundations. So it's a, it's a good thing, and it reflects um, you know, all the kinds of things that you were working on, believing in, and, um, and the growth in the, in the developing world. So um, that is, um, in addition to the numbers, though, we also did we wrote about best practices, what's working. And the criteria we use were really all the criteria that we learned from Aga Khan and other really excellent um, you know, private groups that I, that I rattled off. Sustainability, demand-driven, local involvement, and um, uh, you know, working uh, from the ground up. And so we actually, I was showing them over um, right before we got in here that we actually featured the, in 2008, in our 2008 index, which can be found online too, on, in Stories of Success, we featured the Aga Khan Foundation and uh, the Aga Khan University, of which they'll be talking about, as really one of the most well-known and famous of Islamist charities, as, and uh, the crown jewel being the Aga Khan University, of which you were the, the founding president. So, um, just another word about our second product <clears throat> that is also on our website um, is what we are, this is a study on um, philanthropic freedom that we completed last year. And we now have received funds. What this measures is the enabling environment. This index me measures how much and what we think is working. And this is looking at, okay, what, what are the barriers and incentives to giving uh, in all countries? So. Um, in this, we did 13 countries, and we, we measured them, and then we ranked them, and then we compared them. Mm -hmm. Much like, for those of you that know it, the World Bank Doing Business Report, um, it ranks countries by the ease of, do, of, setting, of getting a business license, of setting up a company, of repatriating profits, et cetera. And so that, this is now basically kind of a study on the Doing Philanthropy <laughs> Report. We even debated about even possibly calling it that. So, um, and this is, we now have uh, funding, we're very excited, from the Mott Foundation and the Canadian IDRC and the Templeton Foundation to expand this from 13 countries into um, 60 countries, hopefully 60 countries. And um, we hope that we'll be able to in a, then include Pakistan in this as well, because what this is doing is measuring the ease of nonprofit registration, all of the, the barriers and incentives to taxation for 
encouraging deductions and, and credits, and then the ease of transferring money back and forth, the cross-border flow. So the real key things to being able to give. So it essentially, you know, completes the loop on the importance of strengthening civil society and essentially um, <clears throat> makes us, you know, it, it, we believe that by um, measuring uh, philanthropy, measuring anything, you will help improve it, you will help it grow. And it very much follows you know, the British physicist Lord Kelvin who said if you measure it, it will improve and the Six Sigma, six sigma management philosophy of if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And, and I know you are doing that with your, <laughs> your measuring as well. Um, and so we hope to, with these publications and comparing and bringing success stories to light, we hope to help grow philanthropy. And we believe that by growing philanthropy, you strengthen civil society. And you strengthen civil society by one, creating institutions and the necessary counterweights to central government control, those institutions outside of government who can always, you know, um, who can help society thrive that way. And you also create institutions where different faiths, genders, and races can come together at the community level and work together on common problems, which creates the pluralism that is so necessary to growth and to democratic economic growth and development. So I think with that, um, I would just say, if I had a hat, well, if I had a hat, I would say kudos and hats off to the Aga Khan Foundation for being way ahead of the game and, and really contributing to, you know, I think a big part of what we're seeing in the world today in terms of the Thank community you. involvement. So, and I would first like to say I'm going to turn the mic over to Mirza, but if you notice, Mirza and I, we are representing the right and the left. <laughs> um, we each broke our wrist. <laughs> Not at the same event <laughs> or in the same country or at the same time, <laughs> but we are, he is recently out of a cast. I'm about um, several weeks out of a cast. So we thought we would be the bookends of this <laughs> conversation here with our, our um, wrist braces on. So Mirza, over uh, to you. Thank you, Carol. Um, <laughs> I see my mic is working well. Um, yes. Uh, and thank you for the kind words that you gave about the Aga Khan uh, network. And I want to just sort of uh, spend a couple of minutes, if I may, right at the outset to, to expand a little bit on what the Aga Khan Foundation what does and what the Aga Khan Development Network does. Uh, I have the privilege and my predecessor, Iqbal Nurali, who is in the, in the audience, we have the privilege of getting all the kudos for all the work that the Aga Khan Development Network does. <laughs> uh, because everybody uh, talks about how good the Aga Khan Foundation are. are. And we are indeed very good and very happy to hear that. But really, the Aga Khan Development Network is a composite body of some 13 to 15 agencies established by the Aga Khan over uh, a period of uh, 50 years or so. Uh, they comprise of the universities like the Aga Khan University, University of Central Asia, the Aga Khan Health Services, the Aga Khan Education Services, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. But beyond these social development entities. They are also economic development entities uh, represented by the Diamond Trust Bank <coughs> or the insu Jubilee Insurance Company or the Serena Hotels that some of you might have stayed at. So, um, and I think one of the uniquenesses and one of the reasons why we have the strength that we do in the developing world is the permanency of these institutions. Uh, the Aga Khan Foundation could never be able to uh, support uh, as well as the ability to integrate development processes uh, in certain geographies or certain countries. Uh, and I think that's the uniqueness of the Aga Khan Development Network. And His Highness the Aga Khan himself uh, uh, has been encouraging us within the network to try and work much more like a network so that we can capture the synergies that are there within the network. So that's just a a clarifying note, but you know, um, very happy to take all the credit uh, <laughs> for everything that the Aga Khan Network does. Um, and I want to just make three or four quick points bef before I turn it over to Shams, because we really want to hear about Pakistan today. Um, you know, when you talk about institutions and establishing institutions as a way of building civil society, um, 
We have for a very long time been doing that within the network and outside and have increasingly seized upon in recent years this notion of, well, how do you sustain these organizations? Uh, and, you know, whether it's PCP or whether it's uh, a, 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 a local association or whether it's an international network that might be based in an African or an Asian country, how do these organizations get, get sustained into the future? Um, and we've lamented the fact in ourselves as well as others uh, like uh, Rockefeller Brothers and Mott Foundation that actually some of the organizations that, and institutions that we might have sponsored are not being sustained into the future. And when we, over the last 18 months or 24 months with Mott Foundation and the Rockefeller Fund, uh, Brothers Fund and in, in initially Ford Foundation who are now coming back into the uh, conversation, we, start, we did a consultative process in Asia and in Africa to ask this very question, why is it that civil society organizations are not finding it easy to sustain into the future? And we, 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 we got two major learnings out of that. Firstly, we were uh, abnob abnobnished by the Asian consultation that actually we were not focusing sufficiently in uh, looking at indigenous organizations, indigenous philanthropy that was occurring already. Um, in many countries, wherever we've done surveys, we found that actually organic indigenous <coughs> civil society and community <coughs> philanthropy was, was quite, quite substantial. And so with Mott and Rockefeller Brothers, we've started this notion of creating a global alliance to refresh the thinking around community philanthropy, around people giving for their own needs and building their own institutions, which will have a lot more um, uh, legitimacy, credibility, as well as uh, possibilities for being sustained into the future. So how do you shine the light on what is already happening and how do you foster that? Those are the main things that we are wanting to do with this uh, global alliance for community philanthropy. And uh, Avla is there as well, uh, who is um, um, uh, j recently joined the initiative. And we are very happy to have you on board, uh, Avla, because I think uh, your experience will, will, will much uh, enrich this search <coughs> for how do you find organic civil society and how do you support it and how do you build it? Um, I, 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 and, you know, in terms of trying to mainstream that idea, uh, it's already beginning to happen. And I was just saying to you, Carol, earlier that uh, it was quite uh, an eye-opener for me at the World Bank spring meetings last week to see that they are finally wanting to build a strategy around citizen engagement and how do you do that. Uh, uh, and they'd invited a core group of people to, 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 to look at that. So, you know, I think that the Aga Khan Development Network has got the timing right along with these other uh, organizations. I think that the timing is absolutely right for us to be working in a country like Pakistan uh, and we are very much hoping to forge uh, a stronger link uh, with the Pakistan Center for Philanthropy and I'm delighted that Shams, you made the time to be here this week and I'm delighted that uh, we've had this opportunity to come and speak to you. So. Thank you very much for that, Carol. Lovely. Thank you so much. Well, now, Dr. Laka, please. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. Th thank you very much, Carol uh, and uh, Mirza. Uh, it's been a very generous introduction uh, of the uh, work of the Aga Khan Development Network and uh, the Aga Khan Foundation and myself. I really appreciate that. Um, I was invited to say something about civil society and philanthropy as it relates to Pakistan. And I thought that I would uh, lay out my comments in the next 20 odd minutes uh, on explaining, uh, at least giving my viewpoint on civil society in many developing countries, but also some of the industrialized countries and how it works in my country. Uh, I will then quickly go on to my favorite current theme, and that is that if civil society 
is the driver of socioeconomic development, uh, then philanthropy is the fuel for it. If that is the engine that drives, then philanthropy is the fuel for it. And uh, then quickly move on to a specific example of the Pakistan Center for Philanthropy, uh, how it was created, why it was created, and what does it do to assist civil society. Talking about civil society, uh, most of you are perhaps better clued than I am on uh, and, and know more about civil society um, and its importance in recent times. We have seen the e Egyptian Revolution and the Arab Spring. Uh, we have seen uh, the Tunisian Constitution being written by and with the help of civil society activists so that that constitution as a very unusual example especially in the developing world and a Muslim country you have the right and the left uh, those with very right, rightist viewpoints and those with more liberal viewpoints all coming together to write a constitution and that was facilitated by civil society because uh, people who were leaders in civil society felt it was important for us not to just look at one end of the spectrum, but both. We have also seen uh, the civil rights movement in this country almost exclusively owes its, maybe not quite exclusively, but in very large measure owes its uh, existence and its progress due to civil society. It wasn't some government that got up and said, let's do this. It was Martin Luther King and all his co uh, collaborators and all the organizations that work with uh, the civil society organizations and uh, I think uh, uh, when we look at the the issue of uh, the Ukrainian situation um, you find that it is civil society that has really um, uh, pushed the point about making a change in, in the way we are governed so as we see it uh, Civil society is uh, uh, it's private energy for public good. It's private energy for public good. Um, sadly, over the last decade or two, governments around the world, and I mean around the world, and I include <coughs> the government of the country in which we are present today, have not been able to deliver or have been unwilling to, develop, to develop, deliver what the, the people <coughs> expect. You may be from this side or that side of the political spectrum, it doesn't matter, but there is a sense around the world that governments are not delivering. The model of one vote, one, uh, uh, you know, one person, one vote is not enough of a democracy. And so who is driving this change to a new model, the search for a new model of governance? This is an idea that needs considerable fleshing out. And I don't think in the time we have today we need to get into that. But I would like this very distinguished group to seriously think about the model of governance which the media and, and general public understanding is we need democracy. And what is meant in, by democracy in the United States is very different than what is meant in Brazil or, uh, uh, I mean, if you go to, to Venezuela, they will say, we have a democracy. You go to Pakistan, we have a great democracy. Uh, and India has its own claim. And China, of course, is the leader uh, in this thinking. So we really need to think through this mantra of democracy, which is important, but it needs another. Um, it, if this was democracy 1.0, 1. we need to think of 2.0. Um, and that's where the civil society has to play a role. Now, civil society can't play a role doing all kinds of good things um, in uh, the social sector and maybe sometimes impact investment and the, and the non-social uh, non sector being economics and so on. Uh, it needs support. And just to highlight one point, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, whom I know that most of you are aware of, a fellow at Wharton and a, a very popular uh, social thinker uh, and a futurist, uh, has recently noted in an article that I read in the New York Times 
uh, that uh, from 2000 to 2010 non-profit revenues grew at twice the rate of the national GDP in this country. In other words, this is the growing sector uh, and uh, it is the not-for-profit sector that will probably be the biggest beneficiary, he says, of the cost of reducing the, the cost of, of delivery. For example, if the internet costs almost zero to deliver mail, who is the beneficiary? And many processes around the world are now coming down to lower cost and some of them will go down to near zero. And he feels, and he articulates this, that there is every reason to believe that it will be not for profit organization and civil society that will be the biggest beneficiaries because as governments have not been able to deliver as I mentioned earlier, there is a vacuum. And in our part of the world, that vacuum is largely filled by civil society organizations. Now to do that, they need the support of the citizens as volunteers, but they also need the support of philanthropists. And by philanthropists, I don't mean only the Gates and the Warren Buffetts of this world. I mean any one of us who has given $100 to a particular cause or walked for something and, and contributed. You are a philanthropist as well. In my book, you certainly are. Um, so, uh, and I, I just want to go back to the point that Carol made, and, and that's exactly the point I had written here, which is that 80% of the contributions to developing countries were from government-related donor agencies or governments, and 20% from the private sector. The ratio has, has been inverted. Now, that money is going somewhere. Our aim should be to try and channel that support to the right causes which help the common person in a given country. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we then find that the American model of philanthropy is probably still one of the best and the most worthy of emulation. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the foundations in this country uh, and the not-for-profit sector, it's aid, they are aided by uh, uh, an enabling legal and fiscal uh, uh, environment through the laws, and they are among the strongest and the best managed in the world, with impact that transcends their own borders and makes life better for millions around the world. It's, it's a fact. And we've seen evidence this morning in all these beautiful publications that we, we were introduced to. Uh, and if there is this generosity in the United States and other parts, uh, it is our understanding and our um, the research shows that Muslim countries and other developing countries, but I'm just citing Muslim countries as a, as a, as a gener, um, this is an inherent and inbuilt um, impulse to give. The question is how do we turn this impulse to give in and, and ignite it into a flame of philanthropy. And this impulse to give comes from the scriptures, from the Holy Quran. And, and those scriptures are, are common to, to Judaism. Uh, they, you'll find them in Christianity. I have a number of uh, quotes from the Bible and, uh, and the book of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, which just encourage people to give. Uh, and even in the time of Prophet Muhammad, about 1400 plus years ago, we found that the state established institutions to take care of the less privileged. And even while the state was doing that, the uh, private sector initiatives were very, very prominent. For example, there were endowments created for schools, uh, for, uh, for health related activities endowments created even for maintaining a single well and for madrasas and so forth. So the concept of endowment or waqaf, which is known in, in Islamic uh, parlance, uh, in Muslim parlance, uh, they were very, very uh, much part of the original thinking. And there are umpteen examples of that uh, around the world. 
uh, the, the example of Noor Al Hussein Foundation in Jordan that works with grassroots uh, uh, development activities, especially the rights of women. We have the Hamdard Foundation, again a modern uh, example, which uh, produces uh, or, uh, and, and conducts research in, uh, in uh, um, uh, local medicine. And it, it, the, co the, the income is then used to fund scholarship and recently they have established a university uh, with the income from the sale of these pharmaceuticals uh, which they have uh, uh, put on the market. In Zanzibar, just as an African example, in Zanzibar we have seen the example of a large number of mosques coming together and developing economic activities around the mosques so that the income from the strip malls, if I may use an American expression, uh, is then diverted to support the educational activities of those mosques. And the Aga Khan Development Network, you uh, uh, explained that uh, at length. This is another initiative uh, of a modern uh, Muslim uh, character. I would like to quickly move on to say that if there is that much philanthropy, one of the problems <coughs> of philanthropy is how to do it. Andrew Carnegie, if you recall, mentioned uh, in one of his many wise statements that any fool can make money. <laughs> but it takes a wise man to give it away. Whom do you give to? How do you give to? How do you create accountability? How do you know that I should give him more or not more or pull back? It takes a lot of effort and ergo Bill and Melinda are spending all their time not looking after Microsoft, but looking after their charity because if they don't do that, this huge bolus of money together Mr. with Mr. Buffett's money is not going to come to much good. And it needs a, a wise man to give it away. I, I always remember Andrew Carnegie every time I talk to a civil society organization or a philanthropy uh, foundation. And so uh, one of Two of the lessons that we have learned is that uh, we need to take a strategic approach to organizing philanthropy and strengthening civil society. Um, now this has its roots in the great religions of the world but also in the great experiences of modern day uh, states and, and modern day uh, 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 foundations and other institutions. So when we were looking at Pakistan, now coming to Pakistan, uh, it was interesting that the, His Highness the Aga Khan uh, asked a question about 16, 17 years ago to, uh, to some of us and said, look, I see that there is a good bit of economic development taking place in Pakistan, in India, in, in Bangladesh. Things are moving. Economically, they're doing all right. And they are generous people because I know what they give. The question is how do we harness this generosity to, to encourage it towards the creation of social assets. In other words, the generosity is largely going to feed the poor or clothe those who are underprivileged. Uh, but are we doing something on a sustainable basis? Are we giving fish or should we be teaching them how to? And so the second question was, how long can a country like Pakistan rely on overseas benevolence when we have a vibrant society that is very generous? Can we do a research on this? What is it that people give in Pakistan? And so a study was commissioned. And in that study, we came up with some incredible figures. Um, and it was, it was done with, uh, with the help of a scholar based at Johns Hopkins, uh, Solomon, what was his name? Lester Solomon. Lester Solomon. And I, he was very helpful to us uh, as a peer review. He wasn't the prime move, mover in this, but he, we felt that the study that he had conducted of the U.S. philanthropy, we should use the same methodology for Pakistan so that it could be internationally uh, seen to be uh, a, a, of a peer study. We found that um, in terms of per capita giving in proportion to their incomes, Pakistanis were at least as generous as the U.S. citizens. 
Surprise, surprise. Surprise number two, the volunteering component also was very substantial with a 58% of the population participating in voluntary service, which is twice the global average and exceeds the famously high proportion of volunteerism in the United States. Now, these are peer-reviewed studies published and all that, so they are available. So I, I'm simply saying these were some of the surprises we had. Number three, the aggregate giving in cash, kind, and volunteer service <coughs> in the year 1999 totaled about 70 billion rupees or converted into dollars, it will be little less than $2 billion, 98. Uh, this is even more impressive when compared to uh, the 84 billion rupees, 70 billion, 84 billion spent by the government of Pakistan and all the provinces of the country into social uh, development and health and education. It's almost equal to. Mm -hmm. um, so here is a measurement of philanthropy which indicates that it is doing as much good almost as the government is putting into social development. Um, interestingly, when we looked at grants coming in to Pakistan, during that period, I don't mean aid in the classic sense. Aid is usually soft money, soft loan rather, and then there is a grant. The indigenous philanthropy was five times greater than grants coming from overseas. A World Bank loan is a loan. It's not a grant. Somebody in the future generation will have to repay. So there is a generous society and the question then arises, how do we capture this generosity into <coughs> social sector development? So when we found this information, we mustered a large group of corporate leaders, eminent citizens, civil society leaders, and said, what, here are the results. What should we do to harness this philanthropy? The conclusion was an international conference at which everybody got together and said, we must have an institutionalized approach to promoting philanthropy. This institutionalized approach, ladies and gentlemen, is eventually known as the Pakistan Center for Philanthropy. I happen to be leading the group that was thinking through for a couple of years to this international conference. And since then, I've been very fortunate to be the chairperson of the Pakistan Center for Philanthropy's board. And uh, my colleague, Babar uh, Malik, is here. He is uh, one of the senior executives of that center. Uh, and, and we are here to visit with the Aga Khan Foundation and others, uh, in, including the Global uh, Donors Forum that we, we were speaking at uh, a day or two ago. The interesting part is that this center uh, has a number of strategies, which are first and foremost to enhance the volume and effectiveness of philanthropy. Any fool can give money, but the effective giving and what results it brings are very important. Second, it does this by engendering and fostering trust. There is a huge deficit of trust between civil society organizations or CSOs or not-for-profit organizations who want support and donors who want to give, but I don't know if these, guys, these are the guys that I should be giving to. How do I know where my money goes? I don't know, whatever happens to it. So we created a very powerful and interesting program called Certification of NGOs, or CSOs, mm -hmm. we call them CSOs, mm -hmm. Civil Society Organizations. And just like a corporation is, uh, or a bank is, is, is uh, nowadays even banks are suspect of that, but that's a different <laughs> story. Um, the, the, the question is, can we have a certification which says this civil society organization is, is doing good in terms of its governance, in terms of its gender balance, in terms of its programs, what it, its recipients think of it, et cetera, et cetera. And their accounts are audited. And we started out, and in a slow manner, this thing came forward. And today, we have certified 300 and 
13 odd uh, or, 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 or civil society organizations on 80 different parameters. It's a gold standard. Now what happens with the gold standard? We work with the government so that when we certified a CSO, the government automatically granted them tax exempt status, 5013C or the equivalent thereof. So there is the starting point. Any goods that they import from overseas are free of excise duty, import duty, whatever fiscal uh, uh, duties there are or levies. And so there is an immediate advantage to a CSO who is, which is certified. We also went on to say that this certification is not a one-time thing. It is a, after three years, you've got to come back and renew. And the second program was how do you support philanthropic services around, how do we help corporations to become better givers? And we started a survey uh, seven, eight years ago of publicly listed companies on the stock exchange, how much they give, why they give, where they give, whom they give. And this was all published and we worked with the government that the Security and Exchange uh, uh, Authority in our country mandated it on corporations to say you have to disclose how much money or how much in kind or in voluntary services you have rendered to society. So it was then easier for us to collect this material and to analyze it. And from time to time, we have been working very closely with government to do advocacy work. We have learned from the US. We don't call it lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> Neither the PCP has any budget for lobbying. We, we simply say, here is a good cause, and you better sign up on this one. But the good news is that at, uh, two, three years ago, our government decided to roll back all the benefits to, uh, to the foundations and to individuals, how much they can give and so <coughs> forth, tax benefits uh, for, for donations. And they said, we're going to have them. And within 48 hours, we went to work. We met with the serious politicians in government and the opposition. The conclusion was they rolled back that, that, uh, that uh, clause in the bill, in the finance mm -hmm. bill. And so we felt very uh, happy that we had a clout. Now, just last uh, two, three months ago, the government introduced an NGO regulatory bill. And whom do they invite to have a first look at this? It was the PCP. We know you. You're working with us. You represent civil society. Can you tell us if this bill is good enough? And uh, my friend, uh, Barbara, was uh, very much involved there. I was involved. And the interesting part is, several draconian uh, clauses in the, in the proposed bill have been rolled back. Mm -hmm. And some good things have been put in place so that the people are not scared away if they want to do good you know, charity or do civil society organization. So I'm just going to conclude by saying that there are a few interesting conclusions we have reached. These are only a few, but uh, in the time available, I think I'd like to emphasize that the ethos of giving in Muslim societies is all is pervasive. That ethos of giving. You look at any Muslim society, I can't speak for other societies because I haven't studied them. I'm sure it is there as well. In Pakistan, for example, 28% of all giving, including the 2 billion that I mentioned earlier, 28% of all giving is done by those who are earning less than $2 a day. Less than $2 a day. They are not Mr. Rockefeller. But they are, by ethos of their religion, by their culture, by whatever societal uh, understanding, they want to give to the neighbor who doesn't have two meals, and they have already three meals. So. The second one is, as government performance con continues to lag public expectations, civil society will be increasingly called upon to fill this gap. And you are very eminent representatives. I'm sure most of you are representing civil society of one sort or the other. And you've got to strengthen yourselves to deliver. The second one, the third is, economies in the developing world are growing f at a faster pace than many industrialized countries. And therefore, with corporate philanthropy playing a bigger role, uh, 
uh, uh, you will find that in Pakistan, corporate philanthropy grew 18 folds in the last seven years. 18 folds. Uh, and this growth in the economy augurs well for charitable giving by individuals and corporations, and thereby I sincerely hope that the fuel of uh, uh, philanthropy will continue to drive the engine of civil society. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, very <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Lucka. Um, we really appreciate those comments. And I think in order to give everybody a chance to talk, and I know Mirza and I will probably have some comments on your, your wonderful remarks. Um, why don't we turn this over to the audience now so we'll maximize the time for, for discussion. And we have some microphones. We have, uh, per, if, if you'll raise your hand really high and here, and you will, this is one of our wonderful interns coming who work with us from all over the country. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, hello, Salakam. Thank you for a very wonderful talk. Um, Dr. Could, could you just give us your name My and name your yes, association? Give your name and your institution. My name right. is Akif. I work with a nonprofit called Convergence here in the U.S. And a program that we run is the U.S.-Pakistan Leaders Forum to match make American and Pakistani leaders in different sectors. In my visits to Pakistan, I have had the privilege of meeting a number of civil society groups around the country, local, uh, provincial, national. One really standout feature was how they served as a leadership training ground for non-elites across the country. And I would love for a comment from you on that aspect of it. The second thing I observed was in some parts of Pakistan, those leaders became more effective participants in government bureaucracy and elected office, especially at the local level. Mm -hmm. There was a stronger link to the society, local society, and there was just more competence going into those positions. So I would love to hear, Dr. Saab, your comments to those two points. And to your wonderful uh, research, we know that civil society struggles to scale to meet the population needs in, in, in many of these countries. It's just there's so many people. Uh, and if the government lags behind, civil society fills gaps to a certain volume. Is there a path that you can see where perhaps as a training ground for better effective government leaders civil society has a role to play in helping government scale more effectively to fill the roles it should serve in social development. Do you want me to take one, time, one, one question at a time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, fine. That's good. Let's, uh, uh, civil society organizations being excellent training grounds for leaders, the answer is definitely so. Because unfortunately, politicians and civil servants <coughs> who should be doing that work are <coughs> only in contact with the people at the time of election or if they need to build a road and they need the people to come in and say, well, we're going to do something for you. Uh, therefore, it is the leaders of civil society and the theme of my talk also was it is a civil society that is filling the gap that is very important. And I remember telling um, Jackie Novogratz, uh, of the Ecumen yes, right. uh, Fund. Yes, I know her well. She, we yes. featured her as well. Right. When she was in the Pakistan, we had a very nice dinner together. And um, <laughs> she explained to us about the work of Ecumen. Um, Wendy Kopp came over for mm -hmm. teach, um, uh, to teach, America. Uh, to teach to America. And we spoke about that. And I said to both of them on separate occasions that I don't see the greatest value of your institutions as being creating social impact through social investment or impact investment, I told this to Jackie, your biggest imp impact is creation of leaders. Because they take the best that comes out of our country who have come back from overseas at, uh, you know, studying the best of universities around the world and they give them the incentive to come up with creative thinking mm -hmm. and creative ideas. So I think civil society has you absolutely right on. The leaders becoming the deliverers, it's axiomatic. Uh, and then how can we leverage this? Uh, well, first of all, I'm very grateful to Hudson Institute and Carol, you and your team, for inviting us here into the AKF 
for making all of this possible. Uh, we are exploring ways in which how we can do exactly what you have. One of our second item on the agenda is how can we work together to create better effectiveness of civil society organizations. Did you uh, want to ask any follow-up on that? Since no. Okay, yes. good, good. Yeah, thank you. Is it? Okay, we have more questions, yeah. Right there. Hi, I'm Doug Rudson from the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. Oh, excuse me, I have to make an introduction here. <laughs> Doug Rudson from the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, which is one of, which is the, it really is our leading, you're, you are our guide and our leader in so much of what we do because Doug's organization measures um, the entire nonprofit laws and regulations in great detail and publishes vast amounts of data and he is helping so many organizations with our products to make sure what we're doing is is fitting into what the needs are. So I'm, I'm Doug, I didn't see you here. I'm really happy you're here. Thanks. I'll give you your money after. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for organizing this fascinating panel. Thank you for your keen insights. I was wondering if you could share a few additional perspectives on the draft law that would regulate cross-border philanthropy and foreign funding. What are your perspectives generally on the bill and what's your prognosis for that bill? Okay. Well, ICNL, we are very familiar with. We work very regularly with them. Oh, great. Uh, and so uh, I, I would add my, view, my voice to yours to say that here is a very important organization that helps civil society move in the directions we are hoping to. Uh, on the new law that I referred to and you mentioned, um, it started out by having draconian uh, provisions. And when the first hearing took place, I represented the PCP. Our executive director was on the other side of a panel of three or four persons who were invited as experts. To <laughs> but uh, I was not the only one. There were, uh, you know, three dozen, four dozen other uh, leaders in, in, in civil society who explain why this law is, um, is faulty and how can we improve it? What are your objectives? One of the problems was that while in formal contributions through banking channels will get recognized under the law, but anything that's done through other means do not feature at all. So you are just closing the ventilators and keeping the doors open. <laughs> because the bulk of the money that comes in for social sector development in Pakistan is not necessarily from organized charitable institutions or government funding. Right? So we have been challenging them <clears throat> on this. We haven't found the way or how to, but at least the issue has been raised. Secondly, as a result of the efforts that we and some of the other colleagues in Pakistan have been doing, and PCP is taking the leading vo voice in this one, uh, many of the um, uh, un, uh, unhappy clauses have been struck out or have been substantially modified. The bill is now ready to go to parliament. It has to go, to go through two, two uh, houses of parliament. And we'll probably have to sit with some uh, legislators and through committees and so forth to explain to them. And we will need your help. I hope that we can rely on you to look at other models in other countries where the law enables the country to take care of what Pakistan is worried about. And there is a genuine reason to worry. I'm, I'm not saying that this is all uh, just regulatory and it's useless. We need the help of experts to, to, to put together a more effective law. Thank you. On. Yeah. Um, when Professor Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, one of the newspapers in Calcutta. Can you speak a little louder? Uh, one of the, when Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize, one of the papers in, uh, in uh, Calcutta wrote an editorial saying, why, in the sense of Greater Bengal, was Brack or Grameen not working in, uh, in India, in West Bengal? And the answer came back that he had actually approached the government in the 50s or the 60s 
And obviously the Communist Party of West Bengal did not want them working in the villages. Um, in the context of Pakistan, um, I'm retired from International Finance Corporation of the World Bank. And we had many colleagues, many clients who were large industrialists in Pakistan. And I remember one of them talking about working in literacy, funding literacy programs in rural Pakistan. And he basically indicated that the biggest problem was the local elite and the local madrasi. Um, so what are you doing also as a resource center? I mean, the government, there's still a, the government is not all powerful in rural, pa in rural Pakistan. There are many, many parties involved. What are you doing to work with NGOs to deal with that kind of resistance? Well, uh, thank you for, for raising an important question. Um, in my other activities in the country, uh, first of all, PCP is not involved with this type of activity. Mm -hmm. it, its main aim is to promote philanthropy and the effectiveness of philanthropy. But in some of my other activities, including the National Commission for Human Development, the Pakistan Human Development Foundation, uh, and the Benazir Income Support Program, I sit on these boards uh, and some other commissions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been pressing uh, on this same very point that there are vested interests that are not comfortable with the population becoming more educated. I just want to invite your attention 300 years ago, 400 years ago to the United Kingdom, to England, forget the whole United Kingdom. You had the rotten boroughs. They didn't want anybody to be educated. They wanted to get into parliament through a captured or captive vote. And the, uh, by gerrymandering all the constituencies, they managed to do that. And that's the process that we are going through, unfortunately. The thing is that the mirror that we are always shown is the mirror of the 21st century and some of the best working democracies. So it is going to take a little while before we, we make those democracies effective. Uh, and it is not one person, one vote, which is what it is today. We want the one person, one vote, but we want more than, we want the legal system to work, we want the executive to do its job, we want the legislator to do it, and the media. Only recently is the media now becoming much more independent and powerful. And perhaps the best service that is now being performed to address your question is the media, how they are drawing attention to what is not happening in some of these constituencies. And some of us who work in the literacy area and, and primary and secondary education, we are pushing that issue very hard with every single government that we can. Uh, so it, it, it is going to take time, but at least we have found the, the reason to move this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Rick O'Sullivan. I'm with Change Management Solutions. We're a boutique organization that works with developing civil society, particularly associations in developing markets. Um, and I'd like to speak to the model that you, you put together because it's what I've been preaching for some time. That in order for civil society to work, to partially answer Dr. Jahani's question, and become self-sustaining, there has to be a change in the relationship between the government and civil society from a patron-client to a more equal relationship. And what you've done with PCP by negotiating your certifying nonprofit organizations for tax-exempt status, there's been basically a shift in responsibility and, and a shift in wealth, if you will, from the government to your organization by giving you that authority. When I suggest this, I'm always told that can't be done in fill in the blank, uh, particularly Islamic countries. Uh, what you have clearly done that. So uh, could you speak to how you were able to, to do that and what advice you would give to other organizations that are trying to become self-sustaining by taking on more responsibility for the outcome and not just demanding government act. Wow, what a powerful question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it just in a, in a summary, we, first of all, let me admit that we are at the beginning. 
we put our toe in the water, maybe we are learning how to wade. I'm not sure we are ready to swim in deep water. I want to be very uh, mindful of the fact that there are, there are all kinds of, um, um, what, what do you call it, traps over there, if not minefield. Um, the, the, the way we were able to do it is keep our head down, not make a fuss about it, and get civil society to understand what we were trying to do. It is through what other people speak that the voice is then carried. Uh, secondly, we find that it is important not to foster an adversarial relationship with the government, at least in our part of the world. So we usually say to government, here is an interesting idea. When we went for the certification program, there was a lot of resistance by some civil servants and even one or two ministers who didn't understand it. They thought we were trying to take over the government's role. We said, no, we are not. Today, the certification or the approval for a 5013C type of thing is done by uh, the equivalent of our IRS. They are now saying, why should we do this when these guys can do it for us? So we said, uh -uh, we won't do it ourselves. In our panel that certifies that organization, we need, out of the six members, we, we need two from uh, two departments of the government so that you know what transparency is taking place in the process of evaluation. And when we certify somebody, you can turn to your uh, civil servant who is representing the government and said, is this okay? Was it done the right way? And to the, to the credit of our panel, not one of the institutions we have certified has been turned down for anything they went to government for. So it is very much a, uh, it's a gold standard, but unfortunately gold standard means silver and bronze don't come into it. And our struggle now is how do we bring the silver and, and, and bronze standard so that people can graduate slowly to mm -hmm. gold standard, mm -hmm. which is why we only have 300 odd organizations certified. And there are 45,000 of them that are active, active out there. So that's one lesson. Instead of creating adversarial relationship, work with government. Ms. Carol, I'll have Please. to leave in another five minutes, yes, uh, okay. if, if I may. Um, Surely. So if I can just give a, 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 a comment uh, um, to what's been said. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, we are really proud of the experience of, and the example of PCP. And I think there's a long way to go, as you say, Shams. Uh, and what we are hoping to do, and one of the reasons why PCP team is in town, is to work with a few foundations and USAID here to see whether or not we can uh, redouble our efforts in an important country like Pakistan to see whether the baby steps that they've made can be go can en we can enable them to move more into the deep water because Pakistan needs it. The only other point I would make in response to the very uh, interesting question that you posed about scale is that we will need to be mindful as we go forward in this agenda of building civil society. Because as much as we love civil society and want to promote it and want to foster it, it by itself is not going to be the answer or the solution. Uh, particularly when we look at the hundreds and millions of um, destitute or poor people that need basic services. So at the Aga Khan network, what we are trying to do, and was clear in His Highness's speeches at um, the Ogden lecture uh, that he made in, at Brown University a couple of weeks ago. And those of you who don't have a copy of that, uh, that speech, as well as the speech that he made at the Canadian Parliament, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be very happy to, to make available to you. Uh, just see Natalie after, after the event. But in that speech, His Highness was, went at some length to talk about, uh, he didn't use these words, but the, the fusion of government, private sector, and civil society in the modern world that's occurring. And I think that in that fusion, uh, impact investment and what <coughs> Acumen is doing uh, has a major role to play. And we at AKF USA have created a new window of mission-related mm -hmm. investment to mm -hmm. see to what extent can we leverage private resources, the 80% that's flowing into uh, Africa and Asia, 
to actually scale up uh, and support the needs of um, uh, uh, you know of basic services that are that are there, and so the question going forward in that arena is going to be, you know, what is the what is the fusion between civil society and private sector that results in you know massing in achieving universal health and education delivery uh, in Africa and Asia. Um, and I, I, I talk to my colleagues uh, constantly, uh, as Natalie knows, to say there is, this, there is some magic in that, in that space that we haven't quite captured. Uh, you know, why is a philanthropist very happy to give a grant of 100%? But as soon as you say to the same philanthropist, you know, why don't you give me the money and I'll give you 80% back, he sees it as failure. Because in, as a business, if you make negative profits, it's a failure. So there is this space between pure philanthropy and pure investment, which is not being filled. And if you talk to people like Wayne Silby at the Culvert Foundation, uh, he's seized by that, uh, as are we at the Aga Khan Network. Because, uh, uh, and if there is anybody clever, like Jack sitting there at the back taking notes, if you can help us and understand, well, how do you fill that gap uh, and what language can we develop so that the philanthropist and the investor uh, can encroach that space? Because that's the only way we can think of for, for meeting the huge challenges of, uh, of service delivery in particular. Very good. Very good. Um, and, and with that, I would, I would, I would, I'll excuse myself, but it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for organizing this for us. It is and, our and pleasure. I, and I know there'll be a lot more conversations <coughs> after I go. Yes. Uh, and Shams, we catch up tomorrow? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay, you. good. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mirza. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Mirza. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we had some more questions, too. Hello, um, my name is Mary Valander and I'm a student at the Elliott School of International Affairs here in DC. Thank you so much for your talk, it was very interesting. And I would just like to learn a um, bit more about how uh, philanthropic activities in Pakistan has changed over time. The number that you mentioned for um, what uh, has been given by civil society in Pakistan towards philanthropy um, was cited in 1999. How has that changed in the past 15 years? Has it increased, decreased, or stayed the same? And also, what are the issues that civil society um, cares about, and has that changed over time in Pakistan? Good question. Um, I would, I, I'm glad that you asked, because I didn't give that information. Um, we are in the process of updating those <coughs> figures. <coughs> As we speak, a study is underway right across the country uh, to measure uh, the, uh, the quantum and, and uh, the at attributes of uh, philanth uh, individual philanthropy across Pakistan. By the end of this year, we hope to have the study completed. And then it will go through prayer reviews and so forth. We are uh, hoping that we, we, uh, we will have a substantially higher uh, outcome. We've done some earlier studies in the interim from the province of Punjab and the province of Sindh. The Sindh study is about to be completed and we already find that there is a substantial increase to what we had uh, seen before. And the nature of that giving is probably not going to be very different. 80% of all giving is faith-based. Which country am I talking about? Can anybody tell me? He says US, she says Pakistan. Both are right. <laughs> so 80% of all giving around the world, or, uh, in the countries that we know, is faith-based. So don't be surprised. So, because the, the moment I said it was Pakistan, you said, ah, no wonder there is a radicalism over there. Uh, and so we've got to be very careful how we react to some of these statistics. It also, uh, you asked me, the second part was, how has civil society's work changed? It has become much more organized. It has become grassroots level. We have local support organizations in villages 
especially in the northern areas of the uh, of the country where uh, the Aga Khan Rural Support Program is, is very uh, active. They have been encouraging the communities to come together because that's the only way their development can be sustainable after the uh, uh, rural support program moves out, by, then somebody has to sustain that. And that's the only way to do it. Yes, question up here. Thank you so much for this presentation. My name is Melanie Williams. I'm with my colleague, Per Satiani. We're both Humphrey Fellows at AU, Washington College of Law. I'm from Jamaica, um, and Jamaica shares a heritage with Pakistan in terms of- At least of we play cricket together. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we lose a lot more now. It's very <laughs> painful with the West Indies cricket team, but that's another issue. Um, I specialize in pensions, and my concern in terms of, I know you may not work directly in terms of the actual giving for poverty alleviation among the elderly, but if you could share maybe anecdotally or from any studies that you have done in terms of the, the philanthropy, local at the grassroots level that you had mentioned towards alleviating poverty among the elderly. I among know the, the family elderly. would be a key part, but your thoughts, please. All right. I, I have to confess that this is a very specific <coughs> question, and I'm not sure that I have enough data to be able to give you a sensible answer. I can perhaps give you something else that might give you a new perspective. I happen to be on the board of uh, a program called the Benazir Income Support Program, which is the largest poverty alleviation program in the country. We set up this program to support those families who don't have in, uh, enough to eat. In other words, the calorie content in their food is below the normal requirement. That we did, how did we know who's getting the, the right amount of calories or poor or not poor? The World Bank helped us to conduct a study. Through third parties, they saw the whole of population mapped it and said X percentage of the population is below the poverty line and below that there are those who cannot even afford to have a meal or two meals a day or whatever. So we said we're going to target those. How do we target them? We gave them a smart card. Whom do we give the smart? Why did we give that smart card? We gave it because if you send the money, how do you send it? By the post office? And the postman <coughs> says, well, madam, I have brought your, uh, you know, 1,000 rupees or 2,000 rupees or whatever it was, and where's my uh, little bakshish? And that was happening. So we said, cut out the middlemen. And give them a smart card so they go to the bank, go to the ATM, punch in their, their key and they get their money. And who gets the money and who gets the card? Not the head of the household who is generally a man but the head woman in the house, uh, household. Why? Because the head woman is feeding the kids because our main priority is kids. If they are healthy, the next generation has been spoken for. So we gave the money, the card to the lady of the house, per household, one woman, and that woman goes and collects the money, and she then decides whether she wants to buy a new pair of clothes or feed her kids who are going hungry. And the mother will always feed the kids. <laughs> That's one example. Yes, thank you. A question in the back. Hi, uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mashal Shah, and I'm a senior at Georgetown University. I wanted to know, uh, in terms of philanthro philanthropic activity in the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan, have there been a, has there been a shift in terms of how much people are giving due to the uh, U.S. drone strikes in that region? And if so, what kinds of efforts are uh, you know being taken to uh, address the casualties that are occurring due to U.S. drone strikes in that region? Babur, you are familiar with that territory a little better than I am, and particularly about what kind of charities are being take, taking place there. Do you have anything to, to, to respond to that? I, I didn't get the question properly. Can you? you have another mic, too? Do we have two mics? Why don't uh, you yeah, yeah. bring him the one so he'll right. be ready to answer? Sure. I was interested in knowing. <laughs> mics. Thanks. I wanted to know uh, the impact of um, the U.S. drone strikes in the federally administered 
uh, tribal areas of Fata region and how uh, charity work there has been impacted by drones. And because of the remoteness of the region, whether there are you know, any obstacles to uh, providing for the civilians there who have been impacted uh, directly or indirectly by the U.S. drone strikes. Uh, there, there are two ways uh, of answering this question. Number one is that um, because of these, uh, these strikes, um, it is not possible for most of the people to travel to these areas. Uh, most Allah, of this area Allah, is... Just stand up so they can see. And yeah, keep please. it near you. <laughs> so most of these areas are now under military control, so highly secured areas. So it's not possible for civil society organizations or philanthropists to, to go to these areas, which certainly has affected the life of the people there. Um, since this is more uh, like a political issue, um, we, we don't have much of information about what's happening in that area. Even the journalists are not allowed to go uh, in, the, in the tribal areas. Many people from those areas have already moved to uh, refugee camps in Peshawar and in other parts of the country who are being taken care of uh, by different civil society organizations. I but hope that but we, have, we have some certified organizations from <coughs> Fata, haven't we? We, we, we have uh, a, a hospital certified in Tank. Tank is, is in, in Fata, but that's the only organization that is. That's the only that's organization. Strong. Yes, we have another question right here. Good. Good. We, have a few, we have a few more minutes. This is great. Dr. Saab, the one of the common statistics that we hear f about Pakistan is two-thirds of the country is quite young. And as we know, one of the main aspirations of young people is to find work. At whatever level of schooling they graduate from, they need to go work. We know in Pakistani society, in the informal networks that often operate in the corporate sector, it's very hard for most young people to get a foothold. What I observed in Pakistan is that civil society has become quite a space of opportunity for middle class, working class, young people, men and women, to find their first foothold in a working environment. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you to comment on that, one. And two, I've also observed that in Pakistan, civil society has helped local communities uh, gain their, develop social capital and self-confidence as communities and that has become bulwarks against extremism. So it's two separate questions. And in here, a lot of the conversation about Pakistan is about extremism. And I would love for you to talk about how civil society has played a role locally to, withstand, to create the confidence in a community to withstand some of those pressures that they confront. Well, I think th these are very um, deep questions. Uh, and and um, it's not possible to give a full, uh, full and a just answer to your question, but let me attempt. Uh, first of all, the population is young. You are right, almost two-thirds are below the age of 20, uh, which is an asset and it's also a liability. If we cannot keep them engaged right away into jobs or opportunities to earn a living, they will go where somebody tempts them to go. Sadly, successive governments haven't been able to do that, and they haven't focused on it at all, if I may be very frank. They have not focused on it as much as they should have. Civil society, on the other hand, has been working hard. But you know, civil society is not government. And civil society is not a corporation. It needs that fuel, which only philanthropists can provide, and Pakistan uh, generous as a society may be when you put all the resources together in terms of billions it is you know one little city in the United States probably gives as much philanthropy in, in a city foundation than, than, than what people give uh, in, in a given uh, district so uh, yes this is the right stepping stone and yes you're absolutely right that people who don't find jobs uh, in industry or, or doing entrepreneurial activity, they and they are educated, they are picked up by civil society organizations, first as volunteers and then eventually given an opportunity to say, all right, come along and work with us. And even if they are volunteers, they are out of harm's way. I mean, people cannot entice them away. 
it is uh, the, the radicalism is not just confined to the most destitute it is also uh, prevalent among some of the better educated and that is one of the faults of the education system that it is not broad enough now there are radicals in this part of the world as well and this part of the world has one of the best education systems so I'm not always sure when people say if you educate them well there will be no radicalism mm -hmm. the guy who burnt uh, the Quran uh, in Florida or threatened to burn it w had a master's two master's degree he was educated mm -hmm. but he had the wrong kind of education perhaps mm -hmm. and the point that you made about pluralism right. I think that's the key okay. civil society and, and, and bringing people together, the best service they can do is to have respect for diversity, respect for merit, and plural, pluralism, uh, you know, toleration mm -hmm. and tolerance. So, any, uh, do we have time or have we completed? Um, I think we are. We're a little bit past 1.30, but what a great note to leave on the, with the pluralism and what, in the, our, what all of our efforts in strengthening civil society do for helping put check the checks and balances on government control and for creating the pluralism that will is you know the main solution to reducing radicalism so we, I want to thank you um, Dr. Laka for um, being the fuel that has driven our excellent and wonderful conversation thank you. today thank you to thank you. you thank you so much